Warning, there will be spoilers on this show. Please do not send us hate mail. Proceed at your own risk. Welcome to the First Six Podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate. Today I am interviewing Glenn Zipper and Elaine Mongen. Hey guys, how are you doing today? We're good. We're good. How are you doing? I am doing great. Um, so can you guys tell me all about your TV and film careers? Glenn, do you want to go first? Well, I'm um, sure. It's, um, it was a long winding road to make my way into uh, the TV and film business. I started out my career as a criminal prosecutor on the East Coast, um, which uh, probably couldn't be any more different than producing uh, films and TV for a living. Um, but probably as um, a lot of people in life encounter is uh, at some point you realize that a choice you made isn't quite working out. It's not bringing you the happiness that you expected. And then you're at a crossroads and you have to make a decision. Yeah, am I going to stay with this and try and try and make my, um, my, my uh, current uh, profession something that I can live with and something that I can enjoy and just work through it? Or am I going to abandon that and try and take the risk of you know, endeavoring to do something different that will be more exciting to me and something that I'll, I'll love and enjoy? And that's what I did. So I came out uh, from New Jersey to Los Angeles and started knocking on doors, trying to get people to um, give me a chance in the film and TV business. And pretty much every one of those doors got slammed in my face. <laughs> so wasn't wasn't easy at first, but if you're persistent enough, eventually someone will give you a chance, and someone did give me a chance working in documentaries, and then it's really about um, what you can do with that opportunity. And um, fortunately for me, I, I was able to succeed and thrive in the documentary space, and I think since 2010, I've made something like 35 or 40 films and TV series, um, all documentaries for the most part, and um, things like uh, Undefeated, which won the Oscar for Best Documentary and shows on Netflix such as Dogs, which is very popular, thankfully, and um, most recently Challenger, The Final Flight. I can go on and on and on, but I think that's the, the most concise uh, explanation of my journey and, and what I've been doing. That is so fascinating. Um, I just have one quick follow-up question, and then Elaine, feel free to answer. But um, has your career, like when you were a criminal prosecutor, has that influenced your film and TV career in any way? And do you think that you'll draw from that in the future? <clears throat> I think it's, I don't know that I would say it's influenced it. It certainly affected it. Um, you know, one thing is uh, when you find yourself in, in the cauldron of show business, sort of in any, this would be true of any sort of competitive environment um, that someone might work in or any competitive profession someone might work in, there are people who try and take advantage of you. Um, they're going to try and get the, the best deal for themselves at the expense of um, you getting the worst deal for yourself. And just people being aware that I was an attorney made them cautious to try and uh, take advantage of me. And then the other thing was um, when you're entering into a new line of work um, where you don't have a lot of experience, it's nerve wracking for the people who have to trust you. Um, you know, will this person be able to be proficient in in this um, in this profession in show business? And the only thing that probably gave them any confidence was the fact that I had been a criminal prosecutor. In their minds, they're like, "Well, this guy went to law school. He passed the bar exam. He, uh, a prosecutor's office somewhere trusted him to, um, you know, uh, defend the community uh, and protect the community. So he's probably got a baseline." Uh, a level of confidence at the very least. So I think it probably made people a little bit more inclined to take a risk on me. That's awesome. Elaine, so what about you? What's your career story? Uh, well, my story is that uh, I went to film school at Boston University and um, my, let's see, junior year of college, we came to LA on a spring break trip and we met a whole bunch of producers. Um, and producers and directors and executives, you know, a lot of people in the industry that were BU alumni. And I actually didn't think I was gonna move to LA. I always thought I'd move to New York. But after that trip, 
I fell in love with LA and um, somebody that we met with offered me an internship for the summer. And so I came and lived in LA the summer between junior and senior year and I worked as his intern, but he didn't have an assistant. So I, I basically became his assistant for the summer. And then I went back to school and he called me um, halfway through the semester and said, or halfway through the school year rather, and said, he didn't like who was working for him as his assistant. And when I graduated, would I move to LA and become his assistant? So I was, fortunately, I think I was maybe the only person in my class that actually had a, a job lined up right out of college. And then, um, so I, I literally graduated, got my wisdom teeth pulled, packed up a pickup truck and drove cross country and started work on June 1st. And, um, you know, worked for him for a little while and it wasn't quite the right fit. And then my next job was working for a producer named Arnold Copelson, who actually won, he had won the Oscar for Platoon, which was one of my favorite movies. So um, it was pretty surreal because one day I'm a, you know, student in Boston and then months later I'm in Nakatomi Plaza, uh, which for you diehard fans out there, you'll, you'll know what that is. Um, working for, you know, this guy who produced one of the, one of my favorite movies. So that was pretty cool. Um, I worked with him for a little bit and then I went on to work with the West Wing. Um, I worked on that show for the last two seasons and that was incredible um because i got to be on set every day i worked for um a guy named alex graves who was the uh, he was uh, one of the executive producers who was also a director so he directed like half the episodes um so i was on set with him every day and that was a tremendous learning experience um and then i took a little break and then, uh, and then I started working with um, the filmmaking team of Steven Soderbergh and Gregory Jacobs. Uh, and the first movie that I worked on um, as Greg's assistant was The Informant, starring Matt Damon. And I got to go on location um, in uh, Decatur, Illinois. And we also shot in Chicago and uh, St. Louis. So I worked with them for nine years. Um, and got to work on some incredible movies like Contagion, Haywire, both Magic Mike movies, Behind the Candelabra. Um, and my last movie working with the team was Logan Lucky. And while I was working with them, I was promoted to uh, associate producer. So I was associate producer on Magic Mike XXL and Red Oaks. Um, and um, on Logan Lucky, I was an executive for um, Greg's company. Um, and during the time that I was working with them, um, I had applied to, uh, you know, I always aspired to direct and, um, very, you know, one thing that your listeners may not be aware of is Glenn and I actually used to, uh, be a couple. Um, and, uh, we co-wrote a, a short film script called Good Morning, um, and, you know, due to various circumstances, we never we never ended up making the short. And then I had an opportunity to apply to the Warner Brothers Emerging Film Directors Workshop, uh, which was a program where they chose five people out of 5,000 applicants to participate. And the point of the workshop was to take a film through the studio process on a micro level. Um, so I... I uh, took the concept from Good Morning and um, rewrote it so that it had more of a personal angle and uh, submitted the concept and applied to the program. And I was accepted into that program. And uh, it was really, really amazing. Um, Warner Brothers financed all five, sh you know, five short films from five filmmakers. I was one of the five. Um, and we developed the script with our studio executives and then went into prep and ultimately production and post-production. Um, and they had a premiere for us on the Warner Brothers lot and the film did, a lot, did the f festival circuit and won some awards. And um, I got to go to a lot of amazing festivals, um, which was awesome. And Glenn... Uh, collaborated with me on that um, 
I wasn't, uh, I wasn't, uh, because of the way the program was structured, I wasn't allowed to um, formally bring on my own producer, but Glenn was very much uh, an additional producer on that. And he even has a cameo in the movie. Um, <laughs> uh, which is super fun. And then, and, and, you know, the cool thing about that short is, uh, it, it was on, it was on HBO, um, for a while and now it's on Cinemax. Um, so that was a pretty awesome transition. So I, I basically, I left working with Greg and Steven so that I could pursue writing and directing full time. Um, and then, uh, a year later, um, Glenn and I made the film um, Swipe to Death um, for the Sundance Institute and Hulu. Um, and um, that was uh, that was awesome. That is available. You can see it on YouTube for free. Um, it won the grand prize in, in the uh, Huluween Film Fest last year. Um, and uh, yeah, so that brings me to now, while he and I are working on book two of our Devastation Class book series, I'm working on a couple of feature film concepts, and Glenn and I have a couple of film projects that we're working on together as well. That is so cool. You guys both have such incredible, extensive careers. Um, Elaine, can you tell me a little bit about what went into the decision of moving to LA and like... I know you had a job lined up, but still, like, that's a big commitment. Yeah, you know, um, I, it's funny, I, um, I really just wanted to be immersed in the industry, and uh, I didn't realize it, uh, being a student, you know, in Boston, I didn't, and I had a cousin that worked out here, um, she actually, ran Roger Corman's um, film company for a long time. Um, but like, I wasn't super close with her, so I didn't really fully understand that in order to really be immersed in the industry, you really had to be here. You know, f uh, New York has its own independent film um, uh, community and plenty of production happens there. But, you know, like, this is where the studios are. I mean, at the, at the, at the time, you know, there weren't other production centers. Um, Atlanta now has a production center, of course, but, you know, basically having access to, um, a lot of resources and, and jobs, quite frankly. Um, I just felt like, um, being in Los Angeles was the was the best option. And because I had family here and, and a bunch of my friends had also committed to moving, we knew that we had each other in a, as a support system, which was really important. Yeah. Um, do you guys have any advice for any young people in the industry looking to get in as like producers or directors or any of your titles? Um, I mean, from my perspective, you know, it's an, it's, there's no one way to do it. And I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind, um, for anyone thinking about getting into the industry. But, you know, I think learning from the ground up is really important. Um, one thing that was extremely beneficial to me when I directed Good Morning was that I, I understood already what it was like working with a studio because of my extensive experience working with all of the amazing filmmakers that I had worked with. Um, that said, you know, I think it's also equally important to, if you want to be a creator, to, to create. If you're, if you want to produce, you know, uh, introduce yourself to, you know, young filmmakers that, you know, are, that you think are talented, find a piece of material, work with them on the script. Um, you know, I think that, uh, just having, you know, you have to have sort of a lot of endurance to, to, um, be successful in this industry and even just get your foot in the door. So you have to be tenacious and have a lot of endurance and, um, actually like try by doing, you know, when I started out the resources for actually making your own film 
weren't as readily available as they are now. You know, technology was not what it is now. The fact that you can literally make a movie on your phone is something that did not exist uh, when I moved to LA. And and maybe you know, I think that if technology had been different, I probably would have been sort of creating my own stuff earlier. Um, so I encourage any aspiring filmmakers to really go out and actually do it um, while simultaneously learning the business because, you know, having an understanding of what it takes and what goes into creating higher level projects um, is super beneficial. What I would add, hi guys, I'm still here, um, is, <laughs> is um, you know, any of the, your younger listeners out there who, who want to work in this business, whether they want to be directors, writers, actors, something else, they're probably getting a lot of advice already. And it's probably pretty overwhelming and times confusing. And uh, at some point, you know, you, they may draw the conclusion like, um, I don't know that I, I can do that. Or, um, you know, that, that advice um, that someone gave me, it just it isn't resonating with me, but I guess <clears throat> that's what I have to do. What they should know is nobody knows what they're talking about. Now, I don't really know what I'm talking about. Elena doesn't know what she's talking about. She, we we're only speaking about her own experiences. And, any, and anyone who comes at you with um, telling you that there's only one way to do it or um, says that you really, really um, think it's important that you go about it in a very specific way, those are the people that you should immediately ignore. Because people who don't acknowledge that there's, there's an infinite way, <laughs> an infinite amount of ways to go about this are the people that – they're usually the ones who um, are just talking because they want to be heard and aren't really giving you any good advice. Um, and I think the most simple thing that people can do um, would be the same thing that they would do if they wanted to learn how to swim. What is step one? Get in the pool. And, um, and that may mean, you know, for instance, if you wanted to be um, you know, a writer or a director or an actor, put yourself in a community where that, that work is happening you know and it doesn't always have to be los angeles but we can just use los angeles as an example if you're out here and you go to a restaurant uh you know the waiter's an actor the bartender's probably an actor or a screenwriter the host is probably an actor or a screenwriter and if you're around these people and they become your community and your friends you start to um connect with one another and you start start to support one another and you learn from one another and then the the um and then the, the past sort of reveals itself to you um, you don't have to, you know, uh, you know, read from a book or wait for or, or follow some specific uh, list of instructions. If you're just there, if you're in the pool, you will see the doors that are open for you. And it's going to be your choice if you want to walk through that door. And then the second most important thing, and actually it may even be more important, is realize you are going to fail. This is a business of failure. You're going to fail most of the time. And where the people um, see their dreams die uh, most quickly is when they take failure as a, the, um, the ultimate statement on whether or not they can succeed. What you have to do in this business is you have to tolerate that failure and understand that failure is the norm. And then you just have to keep moving forward in the face of that. And if you keep doing that at some point, you're going to find success. Wow. I'm like in, in shock over here. That was like both from both of you guys that was incredible advice thank you and i hope anyone listening to this that is interested in this type of career path is really listening to this so can you guys tell me a little bit about the differences between making tv shows and like limited series versus making films and documentaries sure um well i mean the difference between making documentaries and scripted or narrative projects um are and to overstate the obvious, and when you're doing a scripted project, there's a script. And so you know what's going to happen. It's just about taking what's on that page and finding the way to make it great. With documentaries, you're more in pursuit of an idea, but there is no script. And it's a much more reactive process where sometimes things, um, you think things are going to go in, in a certain way, and they don't. And then you've got to react to that, and you can't just throw up your hands. You still have to work towards the goal of making that film and have it and and doing everything you can to make it be great. So if you are someone who is more nimble, if, there, if you're someone who's a problem solver, um, if you're someone who 
likes that sense of danger and unpredictability, documentaries may be more of a, of a space that you want to be in. Whereas, um, you know, if you want more certainty, if you want more of a roadmap, then you're probably going to uh, want to uh, be on the scripted side of things. Not to say that there's not uh, unpredictability on the scripted things and the need to be reactive there as well. It's just more so on the narrative side, on the, on the, um, on the documentary side to have to be reactive. In terms of um, one-offs versus uh, multi-parts, really, you know, if you're doing, um, for instance, if you take dogs on Netflix as an example, every episode is a standalone episode, right? So it's almost everyone is like making a, its own movie. So you just have to tell that one story and then you can move on to the next story. You don't have to track it across all the, all, uh, you know, an entire, you know, eight or 10 or 12 episode series. And of course, if you're just making a film, it's the same thing. You're just making one, it's gonna have a beginning, middle and an end, and then you're done. But if you're making a, a series that is, that uh, has an arc to it over many episodes, there's all of these moving parts that you're going to have to keep moving in the same direction towards a, a very specific conclusion uh, over a longer period of time. And that's really a hard thing to do. It's like why so many of us, we watch TV shows. And, you know, How many times has someone said, hey, have you watched so-and-so TV show? And your answer is, yeah, I started watching it, but I gave up, right? But why does that happen? It's because you really weren't over after two or three episodes, you weren't tracking those characters. You weren't invested in the story. You were getting bored. And that happens a lot because it's really, really hard to make compelling TV over uh, an extended period of time. And you know, when Elaine and I were growing up, you know, TV series every year were 22 episodes. You know, I've um, just binged on a show on Amazon called The Boys. That was eight episodes. Um, and the, the, it's almost unfathomable to me, and probably Elaine would agree, that uh, it's that the norm used to be having to make 22 hours of television a year for a show. So uh, it's uh, it's a it's definitely two very different worlds. Yeah, I can add that. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, I was listening to an interview with Joel Cohen the other night, and uh, they were talking about. Um, the uh, interviewer was talking about, uh, asked about how he felt about series versus, uh, or long form versus movies. And he was like, look, in movies, there's a middle, a beginning, a middle, and an end. In series, there's a beginning and a middle and a middle and a middle <laughs> and a middle. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, in terms of the, you know, in terms of the nuts and bolts on television, with television and film, you know, you generally, if it's an ongoing series, um, you know, there are so many other moving parts. With a film, it's like, it's a contained unit, right? You like, you start with the same people, you work with the same people throughout the project, and there's an end in sight. You have a schedule, you stick to the schedule, and, you know, obviously, um, things change, especially in times of COVID, you have to make a lot of adjustments, but, um, you know, and, and also generally the director is the captain of the, sh of the, of the show, you know, captain of the ship, um, in series, traditionally writers actually run the show and different directors come in to direct the episodes. And that started to change, um, you know, years ago, probably with, I think it started with um, uh, House of Cards, I think. But, Glenn, do you agree? That's kind of when the shift started. Um, where, like, you know, there started being, with, with original series on Netflix, there started being this goal of having sort of auteur filmmakers come in and create long-form series. And so... But there's certainly, I think, overwhelmingly, writers still are, you know, running series, and so that's a that's also a big difference in in um, in how the shows are made. Um, and on there's often like this sort of like um, cycling in and out of different people and personalities in series, um, and having to track you know, having to track things from episode to episode, um, logistically and creatively. Definitely. Um, so can you guys actually kind of on the same point, can you talk to me a little bit about the rise of 
Netflix and all these different streaming services and doing the 10 episode or eight episode run and like how that affects your careers, like both working in it and just being a consumer of entertainment and watching that. Why don't you take that one first, Elaine? Sure. I mean, I think uh, from the consumer perspective, it's, um, it's awesome and overwhelming. Like, I'll, sometimes it'll take me a half an hour to decide what I'm going to watch on a given night because <laughs> there are so many options and there are so many things that I feel compelled to check out. Um, that said, it's, you know, it's a super exciting time. And, and, and from a filmmaking, you know, a creator um, perspective, it get, there are a lot more options for um, not only the type of content that you can create, but the number of places you can take something. And I think that's very refreshing, um, you know, uh, being a creative. Um, you know, this, our current circumstances with the, um, with, the, with the movie theaters not being in business is, a, a, it's a very disheartening, um, circumstance you know part of the reason why i got into this business is because i wanted to make movies and and i because i love i love the experience of going to a movie theater to see a movie i'm super anal about like where i sit i need to be in the middle middle like i need to like it's a total experience and you know when you're used to going to a movie theater a couple times a week um, to see the latest of, of, you know, what's out there and to have that go away is really super sad, you know, and also just the, I miss the big screen, you know, I, I've been to the drive-in, but I really, really miss that experience of being in the theater. The, on the flip side of that, um, streaming allows a lot more eyeballs, you know, like there are a lot more people that are seeing the content because of, of streaming. And so, you know, if you're looking at it, if the point is to put a creative piece of work out into the world um, and you want as many people to see it as possible, streaming is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, Glenn, what about you? I mean, I agree. I think the only thing I can add is as a producer um, with having all these other platforms out there, there are just more people to sell our stories to. Um, and as these different platforms discover their own identities, um, we are able to identify which projects will be best situated for which platforms, you know. I don't want to call any specific one out because I don't know that they acknowledge this publicly, but there are certain uh, platforms that will tell us, well, we want to be female leaning. And we have other ones that tell us they want to be male leaning. And then other ones tell us that they don't want to do anthology series. And another one might tell us they do want to do anthology series. So we're able to put our list together, understand who the targets are for specific projects. And then we're, we're, it feels like there is an appropriate home for almost anything we want to do. Yeah, this is uh, so interesting. A lot of this stuff I had never heard before, like about this whole I industry as a whole. So you guys mentioned doing your film for Huluween. Can you share with the audience a little bit about what that was? Yeah, yeah, um, happily. Um, so because of Good Morning, I was approached by someone from the Sundance Institute who um, who invited me to submit a script for Huluween uh, last year. And, and Huluween is, a, is um, a competition where a number of filmmakers create uh, a short film um, and uh, Hulu uh, finances the film, uh, all films. And, um, and then they, and then they, you know, compete in this Huluween film fest. And so I was in, I was invited to uh, submit a script and I didn't have an idea. And so my contact reached out a second time and said, have you come up with anything? And I said, no. And then he reached out a third time and said, and I you know, <laughs> said, have you come up with anything? And, uh, 
um, they decided that they want to, uh, it's gotta be, you know, a horror short, but it's also, it also has to have some component of technology, uh, as a theme. And so I kind of threw up my hands and was like, well, I messaged Glenn and, uh, I said, look, I've been invited to submit something. I have no ideas. Um, do you have anything? And literally in like 40 seconds, he's got, he was like, I got an idea. And he like texted me a summary of the idea. And I was like, great, I'll write it over the weekend. And so I wrote a draft over the weekend and we went back and forth and he did his pass on it. And I submitted it on Monday. And, uh, and then like, I don't know, a really long time went by. And then suddenly uh, I got a call that our film, our script had been uh, selected. Um, I think they got like a couple of hundred, uh, they invited a bunch of filmmakers. I think they invited like 200 filmmakers. I think 50 people submitted scripts and they chose seven, uh, if I remember correctly. And then, um, you know, we were off to the races. We had to get, um, you know, we, we had to put the thing together um, and we had a day to shoot it. And uh, so we called up a friend of ours, Bridger Nielsen, to see if he would... Um, uh, be the cinematographer and you know we called up a friend of Glenn's who he had worked with before Saul Herkus to see if he would edit it and because we we knew with this particular project that we really needed a certain type of editor and um, you know we like rallied the troops and we worked with a production company um, and uh, I brought on another producer named uh, Russell Sansgiri and, you know, I called in a bunch of favors. We, we filmed at, um, we did a bunch of location scouting, but because of the, re the restrictions on how much time we had, uh, because the budget was only enough to cover a day of shooting, um, I ended up, uh, we, we ended up calling in favors to two friends uh, and we filmed in their houses. Um, and, uh, you know, we had a casting session and, and Glenn and I, uh, worked together on, on choosing which actors, uh, would be right for the roles. And, um, so I ended up, uh, directing it and producing it and Glenn, um, you know, got story by credit and we co-wrote it and he produced it as well. And, uh, you know, like I said, it was fast and furious. I think, what did we have, like 10 days or something for post-production, Glenn? I don't remember. It was a blur. It was like 10 days or two weeks or something, like a total blur. Um, Saul was like working around the clock. You know, it was just like really, really wild. And literally, like we were sort of up to the minute um, in delivering because there were some issues in post-production. So, you know, it had to drop on uh youtube and on hulu on october 1st because uh you know they need they wanted all the films to drop at the same time so it was this really like super wild ride um and i didn't get a lot of sleep for um weeks but uh we ended up winning the the competition which was super super exciting um and uh you know, it was great. That it is fun. That is so incredible. First of all, congratulations on winning. Second Thank of all, you. I don't know if our audience members who aren't in this type of world will get this, but you had to film the whole thing in a day? Yeah. How did you do that? Um, very quickly. Oh. <laughs> like, oh very my quick. gosh. Yeah. Because yeah, anything, anything takes ages. I know, I know, it's true. I mean, look, we had to be very resourceful and sort of, and and um, economical in how many, you know, how many shots we were setting up, how many takes we would do. Um, thankfully, our actors were awesome. Like they, you know, we didn't, they already came to the casting session with their characters like pretty much dialed in. So. Um, we, you know, I felt like performance wise, we didn't have to give a ton of feedback. Um, 
I think the longest thing is there's a steady cam sequence, um, and that probably took the longest out of anything that we did, just because we had to get the timing right. To a, we had chosen a piece of music um, to set that sequence to, and so we needed to get the timing right to go along with the um, with the music. And uh, there's also I'm actually my hand is in the movie because um, we had somebody lined up to. Uh, to be, um, so I don't want to. I don't want. I don't want to give a spoiler in case uh, your listeners want to check out the movie. Again, it's called Swiped to Death, um, and it's on YouTube. But uh, we had somebody drop out at the last minute, so I was basically like, "I all right, I guess it's gonna be me." We threw on some nail polish, and you know, uh, my arm slash hand is in is in it. So Glenn was the one that was, and I had like a monitor, like you know. I was in a bathtub and so I like literally had the monitor in the bathtub while Glenn was out next to camera. And, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, you know, thank, thankfully Bridger, um, is a rock star. And so he really, um, did an awesome, awesome job, um, uh, as the, not only the cinematographer, but also the operator. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> wow, that certainly sounds like a wild ride. Everyone should go check out all of this stuff that you guys have been plugging because it all sounds so, so good. Um, so how did you guys meet and like decide to start collabor- collaborating on all this stuff? Um, I like your, yeah, I like your version. No, I like your version of the story. Mind. You go ahead. Oh, is that right? Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, Glenn and I met on a, a website called Nerve.com in the personals section, and uh, it actually was a, it doesn't exist anymore. It was a website that was like sort of a lifestyle uh, website that, you know, it was like art and photography and dating and whatever, and so... But the personal section actually shared a database with something called salon.com and also the onion.com. And um, so, and, and it was like sort of marketed as like the, a, a hip way to meet people versus like your traditional like OkCupid or Match or something, like a more edgy uh, dating site. So uh, anyway, we met there and uh, after like, too many lengthy emails. I was like, all right, enough of the diatribes. Do you want to meet or not? And um, we had our, our first date at the Culver Hotel, which is known as housing the um, the hotel that housed uh, many of the munchkins during the filming of The Wizard of Oz. Um, and, uh, you know, we met there, and Glenn likes to say that I was nothing like uh, my photo, um, because in my photo I was wearing like a t-shirt and I was with a mo- uh, with my motorcycle and I had like a tattoo showing and I showed up like in a trench coat for our date because it was raining, I like to add, <laughs> but uh, he likes to say I looked like some like corporate conservative, conservative executive. Anyway, we immediately hit it off and immediately bonded over our uh, love of um, genre, all things genre, specifically science fiction. Um, and, uh, the bar was closing. And so, um, I do not advise that your listeners ever do this. Uh, the bar was closing early and we didn't know, and we were having such a great time. He was like, do you want to come back and have a drink at my place? And I was like, sure. Um, which is really dumb because I didn't tell anybody where I was going. So my advice to anyone who is like having a blind date is always tell somebody where you're going. Um, but, uh, I went, I went and, um, we, what's hilarious is the first date turned into an overnight binge watch of, uh, the Ron Moore version of Battlestar Galactica. Um, and so that just shows you how, uh, nerdtastic we are. Um, Being nerdy is the best though. Like, <laughs> it's the most fun. It leads into overnights of Battlestar Galactica. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So we, um, we quickly, uh, you know, after being together for a while, a little bit, a short while, really, we decided that we wanted to collaborate on something together. Um, 
because of our mutual love of sci-fi and and the original concept was basically um you know kids on a ship in space having to overcome some sort of odds um a sort of lord of the flies in space is what we originally came up with and and we had a lot of ins- inspiration from our favorites like star wars and star trek and the last star uh last starfighter and uh, and this movie called Taps, which is actually not sci-fi, um, which was from 1981. If your listeners haven't ever seen it, it's got um, some actors that are famous now, but were not famous then, including uh, Tom Cruise and Timothy Hutton and who else, Glenn? Giancarlo Esposito and uh, yeah. Sean Penn. Uh, anyway, um, so we originally wrote... Uh, we, we decided we were going to write a TV show. And so we wrote like three episodes and a, and a season one Bible. And, uh, we, you know, we really loved the process. Um, but we were nobodies and when people would read it, they'd be like, this is cool. And then, but nobody was willing to like go the extra mile and help us try to get it to people who um, wanted to take it to the next level. And so I had given the scripts to uh, my friend Tom, who at the time was designing book jackets at a publisher in New York, and he was doing jackets for YA books. And uh, I had just sent him the material because I wanted like a fanboy read from somebody that was not in the industry to kind of tell me if it was any good. And uh, he called and said, this is great. I love it. And if you can't get it going as a show, I think it should be a a YA novel Um, because I'm reading a lot now of these YA novels that I'm having to design for. And like, it would be great. So six months later, we were nowhere with it as a series and we saw him. um, It was around Christmas time and we were visiting my dad and uh, he said, hey, can I give the scripts to... um, my editors at the publisher where I work. And we said, I mean, sure. Great. Thank you. You know? And then we got a call a few weeks later that, um, they were really, they loved it, but they wanted to know if we could write a book because, you know, they said, we can't, we can't give you a deal based on a screenplay because we don't know if you can actually write prose. Can you write prose? And, you know, we basically lied through our teeth and we were like, of course we can. No problem. Um, But they were great because they gave us a book. They said, you know, we we would need at least a book proposal, which is, you know, uh, a certain number of actual chapters and then a summary of the rest of the book. So, uh, but because of that interest, uh, we were able to get, I was able to get a lawyer who introduced us to a bunch of agents. And we signed with our agent, Charlie, who's been with us from the beginning. And, and, you know, that set us on the course. So, um, that was a very long answer, but uh, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you totally did, and that was a great one. I actually have your book sitting on my bookshelf right now. It's in good company. It's next to The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings. So Amazing. <laughs> Lucky us. Good yes. stuff. Thank you. Um, well, I've got one last question for you guys today, and that is, what do you have coming up? Oh, boy. Well, for me, I think um, the one thing that I'm allowed to tell you is that we are doing season two of Dogs. So if you're a fan of Dogs on Netflix, you won't have to wait much longer. It'll be out in early 2021. I've seen all the episodes. They're wonderful. And I think that um, the world is really going to enjoy them. But I'm going to continue making more uh, docs and doc series. I actually have another doc coming out in uh, around Thanksgiving. Um, two of them actually. We have one about uh, Frank Zappa. It was directed by Alex Winter, who your listeners probably know as as Bill from Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Um, And that film came out really, really well. And then uh, a little bit earlier, we have another film coming out on Stars uh, called Withdrawn Arms. And that's about Tommy Smith. And Tommy Smith was an Olympic athlete in 1968 uh, who famously at the... uh, at the Olympics, uh, raised his fist, his, uh, his gloved fist in the air to protest. And, um, that image has become iconic over the years, but many people attribute it to meaning something that it actually doesn't. And in uh, the course of telling his story in this film, Tommy tells you 
what that really was supposed to mean and symbolize and how it's really um, supposed to be something to bring us all together than something that would set us apart. That sounds so cool. Yeah. Um, what about you, Elaine? Um, well, in addition to our working on book two of the um, Devastation Class series, uh, um, I am working on a couple of feature film concepts. Um, I'm, I'm superstitious, so I don't like to talk in any detail about what they are, but they're both female-fronted, um, and there's some action in them. Um, and, uh, you know, Glenn and I have a... Glenn and I have a zombie project that we're uh, tooling around with. And, uh, you know, hopefully I'm looking for my next thing to direct. So hopefully that'll happen soon. Well, that all sounds so amazing. Also, Glenn, when you said Frank Zappa documentary, you guys can't currently see my face. But, like my eyebrows went really high up because that sounds so cool. I'm going to have to oh. tell my parents because they will freak out and be so excited to watch that. Have a trailer for that soon. They won't have to wait very long. Cool. All right. Well, everyone, thank you for listening to this. Thank you for being on. You guys can go, our, for our listeners, you can listen to the episode on Read Between the Lines, which is my other podcast, the book one, where I talk to them about their novel, Devastation Class. All right. Well, please write us to us with any suggestions at the first six podcast at gmail.com. If you haven't already, please subscribe. For the first six podcast, I'm Molly Southgate. Uh, I'm Elaine Mungin. And I'm Glenn Zipper. We hope you keep watching and keep listening. Thank you for listening to the first six podcast. This show is hosted by Molly Southgate and Tabby Hollowed. It is edited by Rob Southgate and produced by Southgate Media Group in conjunction with Mastery Media. You can find us on Instagram, Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook at The First Six Podcast. Get in touch with the show at the first six podcast at gmail.com. Please rate and review us wherever you listen to this show. It really helps. Thanks again for listening. Catch you on the next channel.